G'day and welcome to the Grow Small Business Podcast. I'm your host, Troy Truen. Each week, we speak with an owner who has grown a business with 5 to 30 team members to something bigger. Diving into their numbers and unearthing the pain they've experienced, we explore what they did to overcome each barrier and what they would do differently from day one. Let's get into it. We'll have all the show notes and resources mentioned in the cast on our website. From Japan in 2004, Ben saw a gap in the market with Australian customers paying so much more for protein powders and other fitness products. He launched his business in Tasmania and quickly lost his entire $10,000 savings from Japan in a supply order from the USA. Almost giving up, he went to work for the government for a few years while he cashed back up and built the business, adding part-timers until he quit and went full-time in 2011. Now with $27 million in annual sales and 55 team members, they have a strong focus on producing quality products in Tasmania, not offshore, have a fanatical focus on outstanding customer service, for many years have been Australia Post number one customer in Tasmania and now in the top 10 nationally for Express Post, bringing his wife, brother and sister-in-law into the business in key roles has helped the business manage its fast growth and fend off the need for investors. Apart from a bank loan to buy the main warehouse they have been in since 2012, paying it off shortly after, funding has been from cash flow. They invest a lot in culture and professional development, found an ingenious way to make the market aware of a cheating competitor cutting their products with fillers to boost profits. Ben believes the hardest thing in growing a small business is with a family business, ensuring you are maintaining good relationships inside and outside the business, and advice he'd give himself on day one. It's not an outcome that you're seeking, it's the journey itself. Welcome everyone. Today I'm interviewing Ben Crowley from Bulk Nutrients here in beautiful Hewenville, 30 minutes south of Hobart. Thanks for your time, Ben. Cheers. Uh, it's great to be here. Um, maybe we'll start with how we know each other. I think I was contacted by you recently, just in regards to our business. It seems you'd previously introduced Tim to me. It's Tim Polmere from Flatbelly Tea, uh, who's then run some companies since then. Funnily enough, I don't think we've actually met in person before, but um, I've spoken to Tim quite a bit over the last few years. You know, we, we touch base about our various businesses from time to time. Yeah, so Tim... Uh, from Flat Tummy T is always on episode five of the podcast and I, met, I started mentoring Tim back in 2013 and one of the first things I said to him was you need other mentors in the space that you're going into which is online sales of products and I said, suggested that uh, he speak with Nick Haddo from Bruni Island Cheese and yourself Ben because I just read an article about bulk nutrients being the great success as it was and at the time, and I assume it's still the same, you were Australia Post's biggest customer here in Tasmania. So uh, Tim reached out to both you and Nick and I think, you know, he spent that time the last few years getting to know you and and, and seeking your sage wisdom in the growth of an online business. And I've um, been in contact with him quite a bit over the few, last few years, as you said. Um, he's, he's got some really interesting insight. His business is somewhat similar to ours in terms of, you know, we use online facilities to sell products. Ours has had a much greater focus on the actual production of the product, but he certainly has a lot to learn from Tim when it comes to social media marketing and that kind of thing. He's a great marketeer, especially online. I go to yeah. Tim for a lot of advice and mentoring myself. So tell our audience a bit about your business, where it's located, how it started, when it started, and how it makes money. Well, just back to the Australia Post thing, I can proudly say that um, we're still Australia Post's biggest customer in Tasmania. That's by a factor of about 10 or 11. Wow. Um, yeah, so whether that's a good thing or not, um, some people may say, hey, you should have moved into state many years ago. Mm. Um, but look, it works for us. I think in terms of Express Post customers, we're, we're just inside their top 10 Australia-wide. Wow. Yeah. Uh, but obviously, you've got brands like you know, Cash of the Day, The Iconic, some of those huge brands who are many, many times larger than us. Yeah. So, like, where, where you got the idea from, what year, how did it all, you know, yep. take, takes back to the yep. start, I guess. Yeah. Okay, so for me, it all started when I was teaching English in Japan. Uh, I was just a typical young guy before that, um, did a lot of partying, um, you know, playing around and then decided that I need to uh, make some serious decisions with my life. Uh, I thought getting out of Australia and going to Japan would be a good thing to do. Yep. So I did a course, which was um, IELTS course, I think it is, which is teaching English as a second language. And then went to Japan for an adventure. Right. Yeah. yeah, the idea was to go from a very small city, which is Hobart, to one of the biggest cities in the world, which is Tokyo, <laughs> and, and make the most of it. Yep. Yeah. Uh, look, I've always been a, a keen gym goer, love training, and I've used supplements for many years. And it was whilst living in Japan, buying supplements from America, that I realized there was a huge difference in price between what we paid in Australia and what people paid in America. Mm. From there, I thought it would be a great idea to sell American products in Australia. 
But the more research I did on the market, uh, the ingredients, uh, where they were made, how to put the products together, uh, I saw a great opportunity to actually manufacture products ourselves and sell them in our market. Yep. Yeah. Right. Uh, it was the what one of the benefits for me was realizing that um, the existing product on the market didn't suit. Uh, all, all customers' needs. Um, the sup- I've always, often said that the supplement industry for men is a little bit like the cosmetics industry for women. It's all about the hype and the, and the claim and the, you know, the results you're going to get. And a lot of the stuff is marketed on these sort of American ideas, you know, very sort of over the top and the products are very sweet and a, a lot of hype basically. Yep. It was clear that there was a lot of people in Australia that wanted um, you know, pure ingredients. Um, they wanted simple formulas. They wanted things that worked and they wanted great value for money. And those values, I suppose, very much matched, always motivated me. Uh, so the idea was to to service these people's needs by creating a brand which focused on very pure products that were quite simple uh, and connecting that with the online channel, which yep. obviously keeps the costs down. Something that stood out for me, you've just taken me around the facilities here for the first time, which was very impressive and something that really stood out for me, apart from all the stats that your team's keep their eye on, which is, I think is really good, is the big customer service focus and, yeah. and attitude. Maybe talk a little bit about that. Yeah, that, that's an interesting point. Um, it always frustrated me that when you pay less for a service or less for a product, the customer service um, is often equally as bad. Uh, I realized quite early that investing extra in customer service um, would would make people more satisfied. And funnily enough, if, if your prices are the price at the lower end of the market, um, there's generally an expectation of lower customer service. Mm. Um, yeah. Don't know if you've heard this information, but apparently Jetstar is rated higher on customer service than Virgin. <laughs> the reason is, is they actually provide a lower level of customer service, but customers probably expect less. Yes. Um, so they're yeah. not rated on a like-for-like basis. It's amazing that whole perception thing. And for the audience outside of Australia's context, Jetstar is a subsidiary of Qantas and Jetstar was voted the worst airline in the world last year. <laughs> oh, that's true. I looked it up. And have you guessed how many airlines there are in the world? <laughs> a lot. Uh, yeah. I think there's 5,000. <laughs> so that's pretty bad. It says a lot, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, but yeah, I, I didn't like that idea that you know um, cheaper products. Um, I should say cost-effective products. I don't like using the term cheap yeah. either because our, our products are very, very cost-effective. They're very pure. Mm. Uh, they're not cheap products. Uh, but to, to me, that um, selling a product like this, the element of customer service is really important because you, if you're tailoring the right product to the right customer, um, you're going to give them a good experience. You know, if you give them a product that's not suitable for them, product that's not good value for money for them. Um, they're not going to be someone that sort of re- goes on to represent the industry or represent our brand, um, you know, as, as giving them a positive experience. Yeah, yeah right. Yeah. And it gives some context, how many products and how many SKUs, yeah. uh, they're obviously two different things, yeah. uh, roughly do you offer at the moment? So, look, it, it's several several hundred SKUs. Um, our, we've, if I go through the range of our products, we've got um, protein powders, both dairy, egg-based protein powders, a lot of plant-based protein powders, which are becoming more popular. We've got amino acid formulations. They're sort of um, branched chain amino acid recovery products, uh, products to help you sleep, products to help you yeah, recover better after training. I've got fat burner blends. We've got general health products. So that's um, greens blends, reds blends, those kinds of mixes. Yep. And then a range of capsulated products too. Our major sellers are the protein powders. Uh, that's the way sort of the market has always worked, the most effective products. And then the sort of adjunct products, which is the, you know, the, the fat burners or the, the, the sleep products or the other amino acids, uh, or what people generally buy after they buy a protein product. Yeah, right, right. Um, yeah. In 2004, when you started, that was around the time from memory that Tim Ferriss' first hour, four hour work week book came out. Yeah. And his original business was yes. what you're doing now. Yep. So did you, uh, I assume you've read the book. Did you? Take much from it? Look, I read half of the book. Oh. I'd say I'm as bad as different from Tim Ferriss as you can get. <laughs> Look, I'm I'm really big on the manufacturing part of our business. Um, there are a lot of businesses that pride themselves. I think it's um, I use Tesla as an example. They're they're, 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 a, they're a, you know a tech company that happen to sell cars. Yeah. They're probably not the best example actually because um, Tesla are a lot more than that. Yeah. You know, they're, they're really revolution revolutionising the automotive industry. But a lot of companies will sort of it's almost incidental what they sell, but they're a tech company. It's like for us, making really high quality supplements, having them made in Tasmania yep. is, is vitally important to me. Yep. You know, I know we could save money by having 
uh, and make it much easier by having other people manufacture our products and stuff. And we could be a big marketing team, but that's absolutely not what I'm about. Like I'm right. about that that sense of sort of um, satisfaction and pride mm -hmm. in making a product that we can rely on. Uh, you know, we have drug tested athletes, uh, Olympic athletes taking our products, all sorts of people that, that need an absolute level of quality. Yeah. Um, so in comparison to Tim Ferriss, who obviously was about finding the, the, the cheapest yeah. uh, manufacturer he possibly could for his, his product and, and maximizing the margin, um, yep. that's very different to our business model. Mm -hmm. uh, look, that, that said, um, he has a lot of great tips when it comes to organizing a business, streamlining things, and, yep. and having people, um, you know, have, having people to do things effectively for you. Yep. Um, but yeah, and obviously it's an online business too, which is similar to ours. Yeah. And starting out, so you, you started when you got moved back from Japan and and also your brother and your wife both work in the business now. Yep. Were they there in the business from the start or early on? Maybe talk a bit about that. No. So when I moved back from Japan, uh, funnily enough, I, I got stuck in Japan for a, a, an extra two weeks because I overstayed my visa, <laughs> um, which also meant I missed my brother's wedding. Mm -hmm. and I was um, the best man there. So that was a bit embarrassing. Wow. So probably fortunate that my brother and his wife work for me now. I did manage to miss their wedding. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but look, I, I came back, I, I had this idea for a business and it, I, and I'd saved up some money. Um, I didn't have much money beforehand and it looked earned a bit in Japan, but I think I saved up about $10,000 in total, which was, you know, more money than I'd ever had in my whole life. So that was, that was quite, yeah. you know, a, a thing for me. Going into the, I, I continued to do research when I came back, but I was very fortunate to get a job for the government. And probably one thing that I'd, I'd um, express to people as much as possible is, is see if you can get a good supporting job whilst you build your business mm, good advice. Um, and ensure that it, it's workable for, for a long period of time. If anything, I probably gave up that job too late. Uh, but I think it's much safer than the other way where people, you know, uh, quit their jobs, you know, buy the new car, um, get an expensive facility, yeah. basically indebt themselves to the point where, you know, um, they're under pressure straight away. Yeah. Um, I built the business up very differently than that. So this this job I did for the government was interesting. I worked with kids who couldn't be placed in foster care because they were so unruly. So uh, kids that had come out of youth detention, mm -hmm. uh, kids that would sort of, you know, either attack you or smash a wall or whatever else. Yep, yep. Um, but the benefit of this job is I got paid 24 hours a day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Great, yeah. You'd want to because you never could sleep properly. Yeah, um, yeah. But you literally got, if you were there for 24 or 48 hours, yeah. you got paid for that many hours. Right. So I did this job for over two years. Mm -hmm. It allowed me to work for sort of um, two and up to three days a week, so 48, 72 hours. And then the rest of the time I could spend really the business. Really focused on business. That's yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. Which was yeah, very fortunate for me. Uh, mm -hmm. I employed about three people part-time before I gave up that job completely. Right. Okay. Yeah. So maybe we talk about some key numbers you can share to illustrate the growth of the business. Okay. So we started with that, that sort of three staff and then I went full-time. Um, we were basically operating out of a facility that was connected to my house for a series of years. And then in 2011, 2012, we moved down to this big facility at Grove. Mm. We moved from effectively having 100 square metres plus 100 couple of square, a couple of hundred square metres of storage to 2,400 square metres. Now, yep. uh, whilst we didn't need that room straight away, uh, this huge facility allowed us to sort of move in and utilise parts of it as we renovated the other parts. A massive benefit as far as I was concerned because with a business that I saw as having quite a steep growth trajectory, uh, we didn't need to, you know, um, sign new leases and um, new fit outs and then move yep. from building to building, yep. uh, which would have really hampered growth. That's a great strategy is to buy from future proof the business, the, yep. lo the location that is really good. Yeah. Yep. Look, we're quite fortunate in that way that um, we, we went down to Grove. Uh, I remember looking at the real estate websites and the, for this building, for this 2,400 square metre building at Grove, which is um, 30 minutes from the city. Um, we paid about the same price that I would have paid for a block of land that was about 20 minutes from the city. Wow. So, wow. yeah, all, yeah. I, all I did, I, I got creative and, and looked looked mm. south instead of looking north from where I lived, and there were some great opportunities. And yeah. Often, you know, it's, it's sort of opportunities like that that come up that can make a big difference. Yeah, yep. right. Mm. Um, any other indicators of size? Yeah, sorry. So, look, I'll, I'll, I'll go through some yeah. progress here. Right. So, obviously, started that, um, moved here, had about eight people. They were turning about four million or so yeah. a year when we first came to this site, and now it's up to about twenty-seven million a year. Um, the first few years we were here, we had some really, really rapid growth. So that would have been some times where we probably grew about hundred percent 
yep. year on year. Mm-hmm. Um, the last few years has been been more flat, and we're just cultivating a bit of a, a more strategic sort of growth trajectory at the moment, which will you know we're we're hoping sort of more for like five to ten percent a year, which I think is much more sustainable long term. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. So team members grew effectively from two full time equivalents yep. when you were in the government job to now around sixty, I think you mentioned. That's correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah right. sort of fifty to fifty five full timers. Yep. Look, we, we've got our production team, which is sort of fourteen to fifteen people. We've got our dispatch team, would be up to ten people. Our customer service team, uh, which is about five or six. Then we've got obviously managers for those areas. We've got our marketing team, which is another sort of seven people. Uh, we've got a couple of guys in warehouse too, a couple of accounts people. Add all of that up, yeah. about that number. That's great. Um, that's two, two to 50 or 55 in yeah. 15 years. Is That's a phenomenal growth then. Well done. Look, probably more like, actually, yeah, probably more like 11 or 12 years because for, for the right. first three years or so, it really was me by myself. Yep. Yeah. Right. So it was only sort of 2009 that I started employing people. So. Yep. Yep. Great. Well, let's talk a little bit about how you funded the growth of your business. Did you have to take on any bank debt or investors or get government grants or anything like that? No, look, this is another example of where I was fortunate, but um, I'll, I'll be clear, I wasn't fortunate in every situation. Mm-hmm. Um, just going back to an example, sorry, going back to what I mentioned about um, coming back and saving from Japan, um, my first big transaction was a complete failure. So I'd organised to buy a lot of protein from America to get us started in our raw goods, and I, I literally lost all ten thousand dollars <laughs> that I started with. Oh no! Uh, that that was a real turning point for the business, though. Because <laughs> I, I bought a little bit of stock until then, but I, I literally could not get this stock cleared because there were sort of quarantine laws and other things that the, the sellers of the product hadn't adhered to, basically. Right. But I was too inexperienced to know. Yeah. Uh, they couldn't send the stock back to America, uh, so I sort of fought to try to get it for about six months, and then it finally got destroyed. And I, I, I remember sort of looking at it and, and the situation and going, "This is this is a year's worth of work, mm. you know." Mm. That, that my blood, sweat, and tears, and it's just it's just been thrown away. It would, it would have been extremely frustrating. Yeah, look, it was it was really I was very close to throwing in the towel at that stage, and I thought, "Well, I, I got nothing to lose." Yeah, you know? so I'm gonna get back in there and. Um, it was a, about that time, I think, that I got the government job, uh, which made it a lot easier. So basically, in, in the early days, um, I, I, I think I'd moved back to home at that stage. Mm-hmm. So I was putting a huge amount of money from the government job, probably seventy percent of my income or so, yep. into building the business. Mm-hmm. Um, I didn't have a wife or or children, mm-hmm. um, very low expenses, and so for about two for for a couple of years, I, I just kept on building money up in stock. Um, you know, using turnover and, and cash to build websites and those kinds of things uh, until I got to the point where, you know, I, I met my wife and um, we got married and we bought a house mm-hmm. uh, and then I started putting money into the first facility. Great, yeah. Uh, but look, apart from borrowing money to to buy this property, mm-hmm. um, which was, was quickly paid back, you know, because the business was successful, we, we haven't had to lend any money. Um, and one of the advantages is we are we're a positive cash flow business and I think that that's that's a real key to an online business and a real benefit a lot of people don't realize yes um, we have creditors which obviously we have you know up to 60 days credit yeah uh, but all our customers pay up front which yeah. is which cool. is massively handy because I, I understand that cash flow can kill a lot of businesses absolutely cash flow is king that's yep. it's a wonderful business model probably the, the opposite of the whiskey industry <laughs> <laughs> absolutely where you're, you're, you're sinking sort of hundreds of thousands if not more for, for years yeah. and then you get a return you, you know, walk, walk through the bond store every day and just staring at cash sitting in those casks <laughs> waiting, waiting to mature yeah um, and so you haven't taken on any investors in the business just being yourself yeah, no, I haven't. Um, I've had a lot of people that are interested. And look, even nowadays, over the last couple of years particularly, we've had a lot of people wanting to get involved with um, private equity, uh, joint ventures and that kind of thing. Mm. I'm, I'm not opposed to that, but we, we don't need money for growth. Yeah. So for me, it's all about going, uh, what can they offer strategically? What are we missing? Uh, rather than the, the need to, to get funds. One thing that I found interesting, you know, I, I don't know if this is true or not because I, I don't, I haven't actually seen the alternative, but I think a lot of partnerships can break down and a lot of infighting that happens when you have you know, multiple people owning businesses. And I'd say that whilst we haven't made the right decision all the time, um, there hasn't been much conflict in terms of the decisions we've made. Mm. And I, 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 de- I definitely 
you know, don't believe, I don't think my staff believe that I rule like an iron fist and like a Donald Trump and it's my way of the highway. Um, but I, I think, yeah, I think we could see that the way we walked around the warehouse before and the way you were interacting with the team, you, you know, they obviously, for what I could see, showed a lot of respect in, uh, and in reverse as well. So it doesn't, you don't come across, across as an authoritarian leader, that's for sure. And I'll just take, going back to a point you made then about uh, how business partners can go wrong and et cetera. Sam Reed from Willie Smith, who yep. was on the podcast live this week, in podcast number eight, mentioned one of his uh, things that he'd advise himself from day one is uh, really work on your relationship with your business partner and make yes. sure it's always strong. And yep. you obviously, yep. firstly, pick the right business partner, which yep. he's done there with Smithy. But uh, of you know, some of the businesses I'm actually working with at the moment. Uh, having shareholder shit fights, like I just mentioned before we started recording. It, yep. it, it really goes back to getting the right people on the bus, as Jim Collins talks about, and that yep. starts with your investment team, your shareholders. Yep. If you get the wrong yep. people, that can be such a huge distraction and really drag the business sideways rather than you know focusing on growth. Yep. Yeah, look, um, I agree with that too. Whilst we don't have financial shareholders, uh, we have a great management team. Uh, my sister-in-law, Jess, who uh, makes a lot of important decisions with the business, look, we, we have a good relationship. And She's I think the general manager? General manager, yeah, correct, right. yeah. yeah. But I think that there's the sort of understanding of, of uh, be very sure what people do, um, have confidence in them. Uh, I'm quite good once I know someone is capable of, of sort of letting them run with something, mm-hmm. um, maybe to the extent where people would maybe say that I'm disengaged. Yeah. Um, but I'm, I'm I'm very good at, at going. Hey, look, you're comfortable, you're capable. Yeah. Um, I'll let you look after it, yeah. and then you know, obviously, I, I check in as, as managers do, um, see if people need support. But um, don't I, I really don't micromanage. Yeah, um, right. Which I think is yeah, it makes people sort of feel genuinely comfortable, and you know, they have more ownership over their role. And, yeah, you know, they can have much more impact. Yeah, great. Yeah, can you outline one of the most stressful points in your small business growth journey? Losing that ten thousand dollars yeah. <laughs> early on would have been really difficult, but I'd say our industry is a bit fickle. There can be legislative changes. Uh, there can be pro- proposed legislative changes, um, making a decision on, on on which sort of products to, to venture into. Um, all of those things are, are somewhat stressful. Um, even some some issues with competitors and things. I'm just trying to trying to pinpoint something directly. Yeah, what would be the most the number one most stressful memory uh, or chapter look, or uh, so what, one of my interesting stressful memories was um, going through a process of uncovering a competitor who was um, cheating customers quite severely. Wow! Right. So we we actually developed a system where people could test the um, protein content of their product at home. And the reason why we did this is that we had a competitor's product tested. And we realized that they were cutting a pure protein powder with a, a melted extrin, which is effectively like a, like a sugar, yeah. um, at one to one. So their profit margins were sort of going up by about three or four times. Now, uh, their product was actually better tasting than it would have been because it had, you know, this sort of a, this, this filler in. We realized this and it's when you have information like this, it's, it's actually very difficult to expose it because you have to do it in a way where... Um, you know, people trust the information, or I guess that they find this information out themselves. It's like mm. it's like telling someone that they're you know telling a, a friend that their girlfriend yeah. sucks. <laughs> yeah. 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 You have to be quite sensitive about it. But this this is very interesting how this whole thing went who, down. Who better are they going to trust than their peers, other customers? So I think it's a really ingenious way that you've uncovered that. It was a stressful time, but yeah, we developed this kit where people could test the product, and and to this day we we offer a service to the public where you can contact bulk nutrients and test any competitor's product um, you send it you send a sample it doesn't go through us at all goes straight to the, the government controlled lab gets tested and then we get the results and you get the results too right um, it's a way of keeping other companies honest we can see what's going on in the market yeah um, but it, it's really funny too seeing these customers interact with these companies after they get a, a product and while there's, there's no companies that are cutting their product to the extent that we saw you know many years ago it's interesting to watch the interactions and watch the lack of customer service or even the, the aggression that some of these people get from the companies that they're ripped off from, funnily enough. Yep. And what areas in business do you feel you've had to work on the most to add the greatest value? Probably the, the, the professional journey. It's from someone who's very sort of anti-corporate and, and anti, anti-board and, and anti system I suppose you know I, I never dreamed about being a big business person there's nothing about sort of the corporate lifestyle that I I admire 
Um, you know, I prefer more sort of casual, honest, mm. uh, more sort of personable type people. Uh, and I, I definitely resisted taking on that that professionalism to an extent. Uh, you know, I've done director courses now and I've done a lot of management courses. Uh, I, I definitely see the, the, the benefit of doing so. Mm-hmm. Um, but I've never wanted to sort of spoil the, 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 the casual sort of fun relationships that we have um, and what I think that makes our company and what makes most companies special. Uh, I think getting that balance right has been tricky. Yeah. You know, um, in, in employing the right people, ensure they have the, the, com- the spirit of the company that you do whilst being professional enough and yeah. ensuring that, you know, we're, we're, we're getting a great job done, you know, setting goals and targets. That balance between a positive culture and professionalism. Yeah. Yep. So with that anti-corporate kind of sentiment, do you now actually have a board? We don't have a board. Right. No, okay. no. Yeah. We've discussed having an advisory board. Yes. Uh, which which I, I see the merit with. Uh, I, I do think we'll have one in the future. Yeah. Um, certainly having non-executive directors involved too, you know, people yeah. that um, separate the company would be very useful. Those, yeah, not working in the business, they're not emotionally blind at all. It's just too busy with the day-to-day and thinking too much in the business and in the weeds rather than lifting their heads, looking yep. further ahead, yeah. Mm. Absolutely. Uh, I think, too, that the bigger your business gets, the more professional it becomes, mm. um, the more professional your competition, the more input you need from people with a lot of business experience. Yes, I agree. Yeah. And what have you enjoyed the least about managing the fast growth? Like I said before, um, financial strains haven't haven't been there, which has been been nice. Uh, I mean, it hasn't all been easy sailing, but I probably haven't had a lot of the issues that other people do when they're battling cash flow and battling big loans and that kind of thing. I would say that just the, the corporatization and the bureaucracy that comes into a business as you get larger. Uh, we used to develop products very quickly and it would be like a matter of weeks, if not months, whereas now uh, the process needs to be a lot more professional. You, yeah. know, you, yeah. you can't make a mistake and then fix it up afterwards. Everything has to be tested and tried and checked again and... That's less fun, yeah. uh, but it's absolutely necessary. Yeah, absolutely. And what's been the biggest mindset shift for you in the small business growth journey so far? Look, I would say that the the realisation that the product you sell is far more than the physical product. Mm-hmm. And whilst we touched on customer service before being an important component, I've always understood that was the case, but I have a much better understanding now that the, the customer connects with you know the, the, the presentation of your product, you know, how the product tastes, how quickly it's been delivered to them, um, this, the public sentiment of your company, uh, you know the, the the community support that you're involved in, the, the you know the, the vibe and the vision and the values of your company. Yeah. Um, all of that kind of stuff is, is is a big part of what they're buying. At Simon Sinek, I believe that yeah. there's a bit of a, an expression on this one. Yeah. Um, the knowing your why. Yeah, but it's something about it's it's a, what what that person invests in. Right. It's it's they're they're, in, they're investing sort of in, in, in the why rather than the what. Yeah, and, that, not the what or the how. Yeah, there's a, yep. it's one of the top ten TED Talks videos ever yep. watched. It's um, like 2004, 2005, I think. He went on to write the book the, the Why. Or sorry, yep. start with Why. Yep. yep. Great book, great video, and it's so simple, eighteen minute video. And he uses Apple as yep. one of the examples there yes. that people buy their why, not yes. what they yes. make or, yes. or how yep. they make it. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Yeah. So I, I think for us too is that um, because I've always put so much emphasis on the actual product and the purity of the product, um, we we have always had a lot of values, but ensuring that we're we're marketing that properly and that that marketing comes in there too because i'm not a big fan of marketing um but you you don't have to be a big fan of marketing necessarily um, to to market your company well um you've just got to market in the way that's consistent with your company so for us for example uh, marketing isn't about you know having a connection with like a louis vuitton handbag or or advertising in in a very expensive magazine but it might be about you know connecting with the customer at events we we proudly sponsor over 100 events every year Uh, we sponsor a lot of athletes and and influencers that you know we actually do enhance their experience but um connecting with the customers in that way where you're promoting your brand you know in a genuine way i suppose yeah Right. Um, and what's the number one habit you think a small business owner needs to, to develop and maintain? I would say uh, being patient um, and developing good relationships. Yeah. Jump over to growersmallbusiness.com and leave your details to get a short two-minute email I send on Fridays to help small business owners like you become better leaders. I include some reading or professional development resources I've discovered in the last week. 
Great. Well, that moves us on to the next question. Can you talk how you added people to the team, some wins, mistakes, advice for those listening? Originally, it was just organic. Um, so in other words, we can't keep up with capacity in production, so we put people on. Uh, same thing with, with dispatch, we put people on. That's just an as-needed basis. Uh, going to managers was, was quite interesting. Um, you know, you, for me, it was always this struggle with, sorry, I'm, I'm employing someone that, that doesn't actually do the work. Mm. And I always found that, that <laughs> tricky. Yeah, yeah. It's like, hang on, so you, you mean that that guy's going to be get paid more than the production team, but he's not actually going to be making the product? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's this hard concept to get, yeah. And look, as a, um, I don't know what you call me, but a, uh, you know, someone who started the business, um, I started doing literally every job. You know, I started packing the orders, making the orders, you know, uh, turning the mixing machine on. But my, my friend and I actually made our first mixing machine. Yeah. Uh, I'm a very hands-on person. Yeah. So that idea is sort of managers that sort of sit back, not sit back, you know, yeah. but, but do things from a distance. I, I thought it was a bit foreign. <laughs> I have a much better appreciation of it now. And, of course, they're, they're, they're very much involved. They're just not involved in making the product. Yes. Yeah. Um, and our managers are great in that regard. You know, they're... They're very engaged with their teams. Um, they're meeting the team members very often. You know, they're, they're looking at their issues. They're trying to rectify them, and they're, they're trying to improve the environment for everyone. Yeah. Um, right. And what are some of the things you'd recommend to build a sustainable and kick-ass culture to help with the growth? I'd say be attached to people as much as possible. So I talked before about um, us connecting the industry. So that's more sort of a marketing and sales angle. So that's you know ensuring that we're we're at an event. So we meet our customers, we interact with them. But we, we do the same thing with our staff too. So we always have a you know, end of year party, we have um, a mid-year party. Um, we do social stuff together. We do fundraisers and things together. Um, you know, a lot of the staff here will, you know, interact on the weekends and things. Um, we we have, have a, a great company culture. You know, we have basketball hoop outside. Um, we've got a, a 200 square meter gym, which the staff yeah. can use at any time. Right. Mm. Um, I, I think that showing staff, providing those extra things. We've got a couple of work cars, like a van and a ute, which staff can, can book out obviously for free, um, you know, weekends and during the week when they, when they need those kinds of things. Um, providing those little extras to staff, you know, they, they don't cost much money, um, but it's kind of a way of, of you know, showing that you're, you're thoughtful and you care about the staff and you're trying to make their lives a little bit easier in, in, a, in a different kind of way than a pay rise might. I think they say that, you know, people quickly forget pay rises, but other perks and things that they're constantly reminded of uh, can make a difference. Yeah, a lot of HR surveys have wage, what people are paid, about fifth on the reason, yep. list of reasons why they work there. So yeah. things like the culture, the, the mission and vision, the why, what the industry, the product that, that you sell, you know, they've got buy into that, that the manager respects them, all that yep. stuff. Uh, is above pay often. Yeah. yeah, they call it a hygiene factor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Funny with the pay too. I think they say that um, everyone thinks they should be paid more. <laughs> yeah. Yes, that's <laughs> Where, true. <laughs> if you're ensuring that people have um, other benefits, yeah, it's you may have noticed too. We've got quite a multi multicultural yes. um, range of staff. Mm. Um, we've we've got some really important stuff. To me, in terms of the, the African, the Bhutanese community, mm-hmm. probably got so, so five to six members of each community yeah. that, that work with us. Right. Um, but we, we're quite involved in their community outside of work too with yeah. um, the Congolese and Rwandan communities. We're a uh, heavy sponsor of Hobart United. Um, we, we sort of rescued that team about, about eight years ago um, from, from collapse and have, have sort of helped them build up the team to uh, or a club from... 20 to 30 members to now about 200, which is as tiers, um, you know, all through the school age up to veterans and uh, women's team too. Uh, that's an example of, of, of us kind of engaging with the staff yeah, outside yeah. of the workforce. Yeah, well yeah. done, yeah. Yep. How much professional development did you invest in yourself? Not much for quite some time. I'd say that general manager Jess has been, has been great in that regard. So she has a background in teaching and science um, and Coming into this job, it was really important for her, I think, to, to ensure she was learning all the time, uh, and that's been a positive influence on me. Uh, it's, it's more so in the last sort of four to five years. Um, before that point, it was very much working in the business, um, you know, learning things as I go. Um, but since then, in a, a management course, um, leadership courses, um, quite a bit. In terms of hours per week, I would spend definitely a couple of hours per week. Yeah, um, that's good. Yeah, look, one of my difficulties is, is that I there's things that I want to learn about versus things that I should be learning. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. I, I always have, I've always had a massive. My dad's actually a doctor in psychology. I've always had this massive. 
fascination with psychology. Mm. So I, I love reading about some of you know relationships and, and psychology and you know, how people interact and um, look inadvertently I think our business is better because of that. Yes. You know, and that makes me focus on relationships. Um, but I also do try and spend time learning about you know, better management techniques. Yeah. Um, but I think that psychology can be a big part of that. Have you read the book Influence by Robert Cialdini? Uh, no, I haven't. That's no. another one I'll email you after this. Yep. It's a great book. It talks about yep. consumer psychology, uh, pricing, and just the yep. the psychology that uh, companies. Yeah, jot it down. Yep. The, the psychology talks about the psychology that big companies use on consumers to influence them. And there's some, my favourite story in the book. Not that I've finished reading it because I keep giving it away to people. But I've got the audio book now, so I can't give that away. I'm halfway through getting it. Getting, yep. finally finishing the book but my favorite story in the, in the book is um the toy company where the okay. author the author talks about yep. uh this incident that's happened two years in a row at a toy store with his ex-neighbor who used yep. to be a toy executive and it is scary what he explains to him why he just went through these two incidents so i highly recommend that okay. influence yeah by robert cialdini it's a great book okay <clears throat> that'd be good i'll just give you an example of some of the the, the books i i yep. do read um yeah, there's a lot of psychology in here too. Um, Radical Candor is a great one. It's mm-hmm. about communicating uh, yep. in, in work environments. Um, the, the woman, Kim Scott, who wrote that, um, has worked for a lot of high-profile companies, um, Google and not not Amazon, but, but something like that. Yeah. Um, but it's all about having those those clear conversations. Yeah. Um, you know, they're not always fun, um, but they're really important, so you know exactly where people stand. Mm-hmm. Um, Leaders Eat Last we, and Start With One, which both yes. some and some yeah. books. Which is a great, um, and then some other ones. Uh, Principles, mm-hmm. the power of habit. Yeah, I've read uh, that. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and then talking to strangers. Another one I've read recently is Indistractable, right. which which I, I found great. So that's all about you know putting your device down. Yes. Um, setting your life up so you're not constantly distracted by things. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, look, the, probably the books I enjoy most. I go back to psychology. There's one that the wisdom of psychopaths, which is what we can learn from psychopaths. Yep. Um, a massive favourite of mine, 12 Rules of Life by Jordan Peters, who's a fellow I've seen live a couple of times now. Mm-hmm. Um, Built to Last, that's more oh, of a business book. Love that. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yep. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then I've got the, the Course of Love, which is all uh, Elaine de Baton, which is all about yes. relationships. Yeah. Things too. Just sorry, back on Built to Last, Jim Collins, yep. I uh, was re listening to a two hour interview of Jim Collins yesterday. Okay. Uh, about his journey, I'm not sure if you've heard. He doesn't speak that much, but I'll, I'll send that through to you as okay. well. A friend yep. of mine, or Mauser, who was on this cast earlier, it was, it was really insightful, Jim Collins, uh, okay. and how he went about writing Built to Last, Good to Great, yep. and how humble he is with his about his co-author, Jim Boris, uh, etc. I was really blown away with his journey. Yep. Just back on, uh, so Jess, it kind of give an idea of the timeline. Yes. So when did yep. Jess come into the business? Did she start straight away as general manager or work? No, up? yeah. So she she started as a bookkeeper, and I think that she saw this business that was going quite well, and it's just like, hang on, why is my brother in law all over the place with his book? <laughs> <laughs> I think we finally did our tax about three years too late. Oh, right. Yeah. Um, yeah. But you know, we we just invested everything back into the business, so it yeah. wasn't you know we we certainly were in a difficult situation in terms of owing too much money. But I think that she yes, she saw an opportunity. Um, she was having her she had having a second child perhaps, mm-hmm. realizing the teaching didn't work so well in a current situation, so worked for us part time. Uh, she then became, I guess, a bit of a, a default manager. And then through time, as we employed more and more people, more managers in different areas, um, she sort of moved in this general management role. And the last year or two, uh, her role and mine has separated much more. So I've gone into managing the marketing team as well as managing the whole product development experience, which is a big part of my motivation. Yeah. Um, whereas Jess manages operations. So right. that's the end of the manufacturing, the dispatch, the warehousing. Um, and everything that happens at this major site. Yeah. And were there any issues or specifically, did you have any issues having to let go to someone else to, you know, driving a big part of the business? Um, look, I, I'd say I didn't, but I I probably did if you ask other people. Well, I'm going to ask Jess. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no. look, I, it, it's that inadvertent stuff, I think, yeah. too, where you say, oh, I've got no problem relishing control. Yeah. And then something will come up, someone will make a mistake and you're like, what the hell are you doing? Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, and it, it's important to be really conscious of that because whilst we think we've sort of handed control over, um, you, you kind of have to let people leave their mistakes and things too, or at least set the framework and go, look, involve me when X or Y happens. Yeah. Um, but just ensuring you're giving people a bit of latitude at the same time. Yeah, absolutely. Um, <laughs> yeah. 
Let's talk mentors and coaches. Have you had any of those along the way? Uh, look, not really. Um, apart from you know the, the, a lot of the reading that I do, um, probably about the closest would be um, Tim right. Right, from from Flat Tummy Tea, um, who meet up with and things. There's various people that I've met through courses, but no one that I've set regular time with, uh, which which I probably should have done. I, I know that uh, look, Jess has a mentor that she spent a lot of time with, right. and yeah. uh, I've heard you recommend it already, and it's. Yep. It's um, often spoken about, you know, the, the importance of it. Yeah, even if it's uh, peer mentoring um, over a beer, which I yeah. rather enjoy. So yep. that's why Tim and I catch up, still catch up quite regularly. And James from Biteable, who was on the podcast after Tim's. Yep. Three of us, we out for beers and uh, we often talk business. And I really enjoy that. So it's good to just keep, when I was living in London, I did a fair bit of that as well. And Melbourne, just keep meeting up with other business owners and they can share some of your pain and help you through yep. some suggestions of what to do. And, Certain staff issues or grow, growing pains or competitors, etc. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So look, James from Vitamin was very helpful. Recently, I contacted him because we we're looking to put on a digital director mm-hmm. um, who we've now actually put on as a marketing director. Um, but James was really helpful in yeah. terms of um, helping out with with you know having an application they've done and, and mm-hmm. suggestions on staff, which was great. Absolutely. And so and that's the, people ask me all the time. So I've, I think I've been mentoring for about fifteen years now. And people ask me why do I do it, and I really enjoy giving back and helping people make less mistakes and giving them the best shot at success. But the other thing is a, a bit of a selfish reason because I always get something back in return. So yeah. the time that I've spent with Tim, for example, I've gotten so much more value back yeah. uh, or value from that time. Uh, if I've got a question in his domain of experience, I'll, I'll just send him an email, give him a call, and he'll yeah. either give me the answer or tell me to go and speak with someone who's got that answer. So what do you think is the hardest thing in growing a small business? Um, I, th- I think with a family business particularly, which ours is, is ensuring that you're maintaining good relationships um, outside the business and inside the business. Um, I see situations where people, you know, the business might be going well, but they hate each other. <laughs> yeah. And I, I, yeah. I hope that's not, or it's not happening on my side anyway. No, <laughs> that, that, that's that's not happening with us. It's a really tricky thing, but so important to be mm. cognizant of and work on. Yeah. Look, I, I think as a business owner, it's always important to... I remind myself all the time that all of these people are, are working, I'll be blunt, are working to make me richer. Yes. You know, and it's like, hey, you know, you, you can't forget that. And it's like, you, you've got to lead by example. And it's like, you know, you don't, don't, don't knock back a job that, that, you know, you think is below you or, or don't, don't treat with someone with less respect than you because you're giving them a job and giving them an income, but they're effectively building your inheritance and your children's inheritance and whatever else, you know, assuming your business is going well. Um, and that's that's a big deal, you know. It's um, I, I'm I'm very indebted to everyone that's that's put in effort in my business because it's helped me massively in my family, um, and I want to sort of give back by showing them, you know, their, their respect. Yeah, right. Yeah. What's your favourite business book which has helped you the most? Well, we have to to look at my um, my list of audio books again for for that. Look, I'd say I find your why. So that would be. So I'm saying, yeah, it's a great book. Yeah, it is, yeah. it is. But I do listen because I, when I say read or listen, um, I do audio books. They work too. really well. Work yeah. on the car. Yeah. Um, one of the problems with audio books um, when I'm in the car, I can't take notes. But yeah. some of the best audio books I've found is I'll be stopping constantly taking notes yeah. Yeah. and go through the process. So I've been meaning to go over it again and mm. and actually sort of work through the exercises. Yeah. Uh, as opposed to just sort of thinking about them. Any great podcasts or online tool, learning tools you use for professional development? Uh, no, I like listening to Joe Rogan's podcast. Yes. <laughs> Very good. Yeah. yeah, they're more more leisure. This is this is going to be a bit weird, but I, I'm a, I'm a really big believer in learning about the other side. Mm. So basically, um, I consider myself sort of centre left in terms of my values, mm-hmm. but I spend twenty thirty percent of the time reading the Guardian, thirty percent of the time reading ABC, twenty mm-hmm. percent of the time reading normal commercial media. And about 10% of the time reading a website called Breitbart, which is this very sort of right-wing American site. Mm-hmm. Um, it's really important to understand how everyone thinks yes. and it might be different to you. Yeah. And, and I think this supports in the, in the business sense too. It's like some people like really expensive stuff. Um, they're not concerned about the ingredients in the product. It's good to understand why that is. You know, some people are just focused on value. It's good to understand why that is. And and that, that constant sort of reading of different sources um, keeps you in check and, and, and keeps you away from that sort of I don't know, elitist kind of sense, I suppose, where, you know, it's like, like this is us, this is them, um, you know, we're better than they are. 
So I would, it's a bit of a funny answer to your question, but I'd just say, just ensure you you read really widely. Don't get caught up in your bubble, yes. and and always try and appreciate that people that are different. You have a different point of view. Um, it, it's it's no less valid than your own. Totally you know? agree. I went through yeah. that early in my business career. I had an epiphany <clears throat> reading. Yep. Actually, listening to um, one of my favorite podcasts, Manager Tools, and I said this to Mark, one of the founders. When we were playing golf here in Tasmania, actually, uh, once I said, when I listened to the podcast on the behavioral model that they use, that I follow as well, DISC, um, and I listened to the the, car, the cast that introduced all four quadrants, uh, my quadrant is D, high, high D, so dominance. Yep, yep. Uh, task on tr- sorry, task oriented extrovert, and couldn't understand why other quadrants really pissed me off, yeah, okay. particularly in my business partners, because... Yeah. The sales kind of people, the sales yep. is the high eyes, the extrovert people are orientated. My yep. work, <laughs> why, why the fuck don't you get back to work? Go and, go and do something. And then listening to this, Mark um, explain it was just, I, yep. I said to him, and I wrote a blog post about this 10 years ago, it was a falling off a treadmill moment. I literally stopped yep. running on the treadmill when I heard this point and going, yep. ah, that makes sense. Why? I Those kind of people just run me up the wrong way and, it's, yep. and we need them. And yep. That's the important thing. We need, we need that difference in the in the workplace mm. it's interesting too because those people you identified um, they also represent what you dislike or mm. the previous dislike with the marketing thing mm-hmm. you know and often it's like i don't understand those people that don't understand what they do therefore i dislike that yeah. it's like the minute we sort of close ourselves off we're closing off our understanding um you know and it probably prevents you from um, employing great people uh, yeah it's it's one thing that we we did for a long period of time is employ people that we think would get on with us and the rest of the business and wouldn't really rock the boat. Mm. That, that's kind of good to an extent, but often you want your business challenged. Yeah. You know, you, you want people with another initiative. Uh, you want people different to yourself, mm. you know? Yes. Yeah. One tool you'd recommend to help grow a small business? I would say continue learning, continue reinvesting in, you know, in, in study. Um, ensure you're reinvesting in your staff all the time. Ask them what they want to be doing. If they're not forthright with answers, look into different courses, training opportunities and stuff for them. So I'd say that the investment in your staff, not exactly a tool, but yeah. Yep. Great. And last and my favorite question, what would you tell yourself on day one of starting a small business? I would I would remind myself that it's, it's not an outcome that you're seeking, but it's the journey itself. Mm-hmm. So, you know, whether it's that, that certain amount of turnover or that certain amount of you know whether what motivates you that, that house that you're going to buy or that car or whatever else um look have goals you know have things that you aspire to um but ensure that you, you're not sort of working yourself into the ground or, or distracting yourself in the moment to the point where you're not enjoying that experience because that that experience in the moment you know that that interaction with staff and, and that the, you know the eating individual goals every day or whatever um th- that is sort of what life's all about um, you know, not not that thing that you buy. You know, once your company's hit a certain number or whatever else, and it's just that 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 reminder to sort of live in the moment and um, you know, you'll thrive in the moment, I suppose. Yeah, I think rather that, than always looking into the future. I think that's great advice, Ben. Yeah, that's uh, yeah. It's something I certainly took a while to get my head around and, and start to follow that mantra. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Yep. I think it's that thing too of um also a reminder of, of as I've got a little bit older, it's it's like what what legacy do you want to leave? Mm. Like what what do you want yeah. to be known for? And and I kind of decided a long time ago is like I I don't want people at my funeral to kind of talk about this guy that was like like really rich and bought a whole lot of cars. Yeah. Um or, you know, I, I don't want that to be the thing I yeah. remembered for. I want to be remembered for, you know, being a being a nice person, being a kind person, being mm. someone who, you know, made a difference to people's lives. You know, was a good employer. Mm. Um, you know, was trustworthy. Um, yeah, but I think it's important to sort of remind yourself of what's important to you, yes. and and check yourself to ensure that is that how people see you. And yeah. it's not it's not going to happen one hundred percent of the time. Obviously, mm. we've all got our flaws. Um, but I think that that sort of um, cross checking and sort of um, you know questioning yourself, mm. ensuring that that who you want to be and how you're perceived by people is, what you're living. is actually a congruence yeah. there. Yeah. Look, yep. that is a really good chapter in Michael Gerber's book, The E Myth. Have you read that? No. So no. that's uh, yeah. He talks about think about your funeral basically, and yep. people are there, and what they're saying about you, and what life you've lived. So yep. yeah, I totally agree. Mm. Yep, yep. And it's funny too because when I think of everyone I admire, you know, whether business people or sports people or whatever, um, they're they're those sort of humble people who have achieved a lot. 
And they're people who have, who have succeeded through hard work mm. more so than, than than skill. One of my favorite athletes is a guy called Bernard Hopkins, who was actually, he's a professional boxer from America. And he recently retired only a couple of years ago. And he was, he became light heavyweight champion at 49 years of age. Wow. And it was amazing. He, he went to um, jail as a youngster and he, he ended up being world champion for the first time in, in about his 30s. Um, but as he as he got older, he changed his style to suit his aging body, mm. and it was amazing seeing this guy who was this sort of aggressive, you know, pressure fighter when he was young, turning into this really sort of wily, thoughtful veteran who you know knew every trick in the book to mm. win wow. at the end. But just that sort of evolution of his, his sort of sporting um, history was 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 really interesting. Um, but this is an example of someone who I admire who was, was constantly thinking of how can I be better yep. and how can I improve myself and, and how can I do well despite, you know, the, the my situation changing. Yes, that's great. Um, yeah. mm. Well, thanks, yep. Ben. Thanks for your time today. I think the audience will get a heap of value out of, of out of our discussion and in your insights and your growth and congratulations to you and the, the entire team on the growth to date. No worries. Oh, look, I really appreciate you coming down and giving us this opportunity. So no thank you very much. Great. We'll have all the show notes and resources mentioned in the cast on our website. From Japan in 2004, Ben saw a gap in the market with Australian customers paying so much more for protein powders and other fitness products. He launched his business in Tasmania and quickly lost his entire $10,000 savings from Japan in a supply order from the USA. Almost giving up, he went to work for the government for a few years while he cashed back up and built the business, adding part-timers until he quit and went full-time in 2011. Now with $27 million in annual sales and 55 team members, they have a strong focus on producing quality products in Tasmania, not offshore, have a fanatical focus on outstanding customer service, for many years have been Australia Post's number one customer in Tasmania and now in the top 10 nationally for Express Post. Bringing his wife, brother and sister-in-law into the business in key roles has helped the business manage its fast growth and fend off the need for investors. Apart from a bank loan to buy the main warehouse they have been in since 2012, paying it off shortly after, funding has been from cash flow. They invest a lot in cultural and professional development, found an ingenious way to make the market aware of a cheating competitor cutting their products with fillers to boost profits. Ben believes the hardest thing in growing a small business is with a family business, ensuring you are maintaining good relationships inside and outside the business, and advice he'd give himself on day one, it's not an outcome that you're seeking, it's the journey itself. 